Okay, welcome back to all of you to this uh, the second part of this uh, session um, in the human microbiome. Um, now we have uh, three more speakers during this session. Um, the first one that I'm going to introduce now is a Professor Lars uh, Einstrand from Karolinska Institute in Sweden with the talk Culturomics, a crucial part in microbiota collections. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Instant, for uh, accepting this invitation. And the stage is yours. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Can you see my screen? Yes, very thank well. You. Well, it's an honor to be on this uh, uh, meeting and uh, I learned so lot, a lot already. So I think uh, what I can add will be something about culturomics uh, and the, the title, uh, as you can see, is a crucial role in microbiota collections, but also in clinical uh, health care and clinical settings. So uh, I'm here in Stockholm. Actually, we had minus 43 degrees Celsius uh, last week in northern part of Sweden, and now it's plus four Celsius. So I don't know what that makes to the microbiome. But anyway, we are uh, facing <clears throat> lots of climate change here also in northern part of Europe. I want to show some of the pioneers here uh, in this field with a clear appreciation of the role of the microorganism. And you recognize many of them, I assume. They have been studying both uh, microorganisms in disease, but also in health, but with a limited technology toolbox. And especially, I want to highlight Ture Mittfeldt, who is turning 90 next month. Uh, he's, uh, living now in Oslo, but he performed lots of uh, very important gnotobiology work here at Karolinska in the beginning of the 50s, uh, almost 70 years ago. But he's still alive and he's uh, a mentor of many of us in this research field. But as I said, that uh, technology has opened lots of doors to study this new organ. And many of us are aware of the new tools that we can use, like metagenomics, uh, uh, but also metatranscriptomics, metaproteomics, and bolomics, of course. But uh, in my opinion, I still think that the culture part is very important and will be even more important in the future of, of this research. Uh, that means we need to uh, uh, isolate the bacteria, uh, perform uh, genome sequencing with short reads and long reads, uh, get the, this into phylotyping, and test these cultures, uh, single strains or a consortium of strains in different uh, assays, functional assays. So the culture and the culturomics field will uh, hopefully uh, increase in this uh, area of research. Because when we study the metagenomes and all the metagenome assembled genome uh, shotgun data, we know today that the, the reads can be mapped uh, to a microbial genome up to 60%. So that means only half of the mapped reads have a known functional annotations also in the databases. So metagenomic approaches only identify potential functions and it doesn't really tell us if these genes are active or not. And some people say that it's more important to expand the genome catalogs than to perform additional sequencing studies. And I can partly agree on that. Uh, I mean, we have sequenced more than 50,000 shotgun uh, genomes here uh, with, uh, in different populations. And the amount of data is enormous. And what we need now is to really find the key players in this uh, material. And how can you expand these uh, catalogs? Well, to increase and improve uh, the culturomics projects within the microbiota research community, as I mentioned. Uh, also to isolate human bacteria that lack cultured representatives and add high quality genomes to the existing uh, catalogs. And I think this is crucial to understand uh, the new, uh, the new uh, strains that may be of importance for health and disease. And it also allows for strain level resolution. And we heard about that in the first lecture this morning. Uh, and this is essential for understanding functional and phenotypic differences. And I also think, uh, and many of us want to include fungi also now when we have shotgun data where we can identify uh, also fungi in the, in the sample. 
And how can you do this? Well, uh, you can characterize certain enzymes uh, in targeting isolation of bacteria that are lacking in the reference catalogs. And uh, then we need to add comparative genomics, comparative genomics to identify the new strains and their function and increase resolution of microbial gene function. And of course, as we also heard, this is, is an ecosystem where, and we need to have this view on the microbial function. So maybe it's more important to study a consortia of bacteria than just a single bacteria uh, by itself. So we can use the microbiome lens to look at human health uh, in a novel way with all these new omics technologies. But to move this or translate these learnings into a clinical uh, setting or a clinical meaningful intervention needs more. And that is, of course, uh, data-driven life science, as we heard about, but also culture, because we need to have these uh, bacteria or micro microbes up uh, on a plate to really study them uh, for safety, efficiency, and predictability. And then, of course, we need it to, uh, to move it into engineering innovation for manufacturing and, at the end, the regulatory frameworks that will be, of course, very important before we can move this into a clinical setting. We have worked a lot here in Stockholm with uh, large population-based studies to identify what is normal, because if you don't have that reference, it's very hard to say that this is a dysbiotic or a disturbed profile. And we work with clinical partners. Uh, and of course, we have included also um, culture in these sampling uh, approaches. But the sample collection is, of course, very important if you want to add um, uh, culture in your pipeline and the logistics. Uh, and of course, to do this in a large scale requires some kind of high throughput capacity that is also linked to the metagenomic sequencing data that can be achieved. And then uh, the functional profiling can go uh, through bioinformatic uh, analysis, uh, gene mining, and so forth to identify genes of interest. And hopefully this translational approach can be fed back to the clinical partners and the patients at the end. This is one example where we studied, uh, we called for 2,400 individuals that will were referred to endoscopy in Stockholm and 1,260 uh, uh, accepted this. Uh, and the, the key thing here is that to have a very substantial questionnaire where we get lots of metadata from each individual together with the sampling. And in this case, we have fecal samples, but also biopsies from uh, 1,200 individuals. Uh, and uh, we added then the culture part in, in this uh, from different areas in the colon and together with that a blood sample to be able to look at metabolites also in, in these individuals. So it's possible to do this on a large scale. Uh, so the setup for what I think could be uh, uh, important in the future when we know what is normal or healthy is to have this big population-based study as a, a backbone for, for identifying the cases and compare them with the controls. Uh, to move that into a kind of multi-omics analysis pipeline, and I think here we need many tools, not only culture, but also other omics, uh, and transcriptomics will, of course, be of very importance if you want to see the gene transcripts that could be present in, in these samples especially if you have biopsies where you have some kind of host microbe crosstalk in the mucosa layer. Then uh, you can have another approach where you go into uh, probiotic engineering technologies. Uh, it could be, as was mentioned here, also GMP, amendable uh, lab scale bioreactor processing, where you have the entire microbiome amplified uh, and then go from that into well-defined strains and stable consortia. So I think this is a stepwise approach uh, that is truly translational from uh, well-defined cohorts into multi-omics uh, and then uh, consortia and uh, well-defined strains. So the approach uh, that we have used is to have approximately now 160,000 samples in the freezer from uh, Swedish different cohorts uh, that we have uh, um, set up here in, in Sweden where we follow these individuals over time in some cases. Most of our studies have been focused on women's health, 
uh, reproductive health, but also uh, GI and gastrointestinal symptoms. But here you can see that we have then personalized biobanks. We perform the analysis and then we take the samples into a culturomics workflow and a culture collection uh, for uh, future studies. So we go with the local, total enrichment of the entire fecal sample, and we, I will come back to that. Uh, and then we also go for selective enrichment for, for certain strains uh, or isolates, where we go through a, a pipeline uh, for phenotypic characterization and then put everything into a biobank. We also added a technology where we can actually identify certain bacteria based on sequencing data and perform a fishing expedition in this fact sorting approach where we can fish out the, the bacteria of interest because it's not so easy to really identify novel species in a, in a fecal sample, for example. One of the initiatives we have been trying to do is to replace the donor, the fecal microbial transfer donor into some kind of um, consortia or a continuous culture of that material. And uh, you can see here that up to 14 days, we have now a stable consortia that is representing the fecal microbial transplant patient or individual uh, after 14 days. And we can also increase the number of, uh, so to say, beneficial microbes, Clostridia, for example, by playing around with the nutrients and the pH and so forth. And this specific media is also without animal derived products. But the most important part is also to have control of the functional part. And here you can see the, um, uh, the uh, fatty acids and the acetic acid and propionic acid, uh, short chain fatty acid profile. And that is also stable here after 14 days. So by using this approach in the bioreactor, we have a, an opportunity to mass produce a healthy community and give back to the patient. And we are not then depending on a single donor. Uh, donor. We can use that donor and expand the volume uh, by using this kind of approach. Also on top of that, as I mentioned, we also have the, the global metabolomic analysis to be sure that the, the functional part is stable after 14 days in the bioreactor. And this is also done on, uh, on single isolates, of course. This is to show that the, in the vaginal microbiome, we don't have a stable, so to say, consortia over a menstrual cycle. Here are uh, women that have been followed every day for 42 days with a vaginal sample. And you can see here that this woman has a very stable uh, composition of the microbiome in the vagina, uh, dominating with the lactobacillus crispatus. Uh, but here we have another woman with two different lactobacilli uh, during the menstrual cycle. And here we have some transient, tra transient uh, um, genotypes where we have a bacterial vaginosis or Gardnerella present in part of this menstrual, menstrual cycle. And in this woman, we have a quite stable bacterial vaginosis over the menstrual cycle. So this means that if you take a sample at day 14, you may not have a representative uh, sample for the entire uh, menstrual cycle. And also here we can see that if we culture uh, Lactobacillus crispatus uh, single strains, you can see that each strain has his, uh, its own genotype. So there is a huge variation in their genomes. And that also means that uh, every strain may be different from another one, and that also have an impact on the phenotype. So when we test these uh, strains in the pipeline, we can see that there are different options for uh, lactic acid production, hydrogen peroxide production, inhibition for uh, bact bacterial vaginosis bacteria, and also ap uh, epithelial adhesion assays. So we can see that, for example, this stable uh, lactobacillus crispatus was very active for uh, adhesion to uh, HeLa cells compared to uh, this lactobacilli uh, that came from a diverse uh, woman with a very pronounced bacterial vaginosis. So when you select strains from the future in the future consortia, it's important to have uh, individual, so to say, a characterization of each strain and then also move them into a consortia and see how they thrive together, if they kill each other and if it could uh, be developed into a drug later on.
So all these phenotypic characteristics have been tested in, in the strain collection here in Stockholm. And here are also ways to look at adaptation, uh, different culturomics methods. Here we have alcohol treatment method where we select on different plates uh, non-alcohol uh, treated strains with alcohol treated strains. So this is one kind of, uh, so to say, uh, adaptation to that environment. But we also have supplementary methods where we have uh, uh, less uh, agar plates, but we can still have these uh, isolates based on, on non-adaptations of the fourth. And then we move it into a Malditoff and characterize all these strains. So uh, the equipment we use for this is uh, bioreactors, the Malditoff. Uh, this is a different kind of assays uh, to look at 3D um, um, tissue models and organoids to look at the interaction and the immune stimulation and so forth. And here we have a fact sorter inside an anaerobic box where we can uh, fish out the anaerobic fastidious microorganisms and, and expand them here into a glove box. Now, this is what we have isolated so far uh, from the fecal sample. Uh, we have 650 null strains where most of them are characterized. Uh, but here we can see in the vaginal uh, tract, we have almost 1,000 samples, but you can see that there are many unknown that we are now investigating uh, and trying to identify that are not in the gene catalogs. And that will also give us a very unsecure picture of what's going on in this niche uh, when we look in the metagenomic shotgun sequencing. So to develop something for the future uh, uh, for clinical use, I think that it's important to have this translational approach where we have a well-defined study material, uh, move it into some kind of screening through the multi-omics pipelines, and then move it further into a probiotic engineering technology using bioreactors, and then into well-defined strains and stable consortia. So by using this kind of approach, I think uh, this research field can move forward and uh, go into regulatory uh, products in the quite uh, uh, near future. This is one example how one uh, commensal clostridialis strains can actually have an effect on anti-cancer immune uh, response uh, against solid tumors. And this also tells us that maybe bacteria are uh, important for uh, um, uh, without, even without immune checkpoint inhibitors in certain cancers. So this also tells us that we have an opportunity to add these microbes in the future in certain patients, uh, especially in these patients with a, uh, with a cancer that is requiring today checkpoint inhibitors, but even these strains can do the job by themselves. So culturomics is not crucial only for uh, collections, but also for future generations. Professor Einstein, two minutes, please. Yes, I, this is my last slide. This is the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. And I think we have a similar approach now with uh, Gloria's presidency for the strains, even if it's not up in, Nor uh, in Svalbard, but maybe some other place with a secure storage area. And by this, I want to thank you for inviting me and my team here in Stockholm, especially Valerie Valeriano, who is the head of unit for Culturomics, and uh, Yuan Du, who is also a major player in this uh, research field. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Einstrand, for your amazing presentation. Uh, questions will be at the end, as I say before, and please put all your questions in the uh, Q&A uh, button in your, uh, in your uh, Zoom uh, device. Uh, 